Hey everyone, welcome to Singularity Computers Client Build 9, Part 2. In this part of the build log, I'm going to focus on completing the mods. So I'm now going back to work on the front panel mods, and I'm cutting out a piece of 3mm smoked acrylic, and this is going to go in front of the fans. I'm now doing some more work on the 10mm smoked acrylic. I've removed the piece of material in between the two fan holes. There was only 4mm of material left at the narrowest point. The strength was still good, but to improve the aesthetics, I removed it, and as you can see, I've curved it. And I'm now using a sanding attachment on the Dremel to even up the curves. I've beveled all of the edges, and I did this with a file. You need to be careful when doing something like this with a file, because it's very difficult to keep it even, and even the smallest mistake is going to be very easy to see when the panels are complete. The best way to keep it even is to keep up as much horizontal movement as vertical movement. I'm now drilling the mounting holes in the 3mm smoked acrylic. I'm mounting it in six places. Strength is important out here on the front panel. And I'm now drilling the last of the mounting holes in the 10mm smoked acrylic. I was talking about using mesh in front of the fans. Also, I was thinking about leaving the fans completely exposed. But this way, it's going to look a whole lot cleaner. Both of the panels are nearly complete. All I need to do now is polish the edges. So I have here 400, 800 and 1200 grit sandpaper. Also some Novus polish for polishing plastics and acrylic and a cloth polishing attachment on the Dremel. Now I've already taken it back to 240 grit. I actually started at 80. So, you know, if you're cutting the material out with something like a jigsaw, you need to start with a fairly coarse grit sandpaper. And you need to make sure you go overboard with each grit because if you leave behind any marks or scratches, you're probably not going to see them until you start polishing. And then it takes a massive amount of time to go back to a coarse grit sandpaper and start all over again. I suggest you use wet and dry sandpaper with water. It makes things a lot easier. It helps to mobilize the material you'll go through a lot less sandpaper because with acrylic, it clogs the sandpaper very quickly. And the finer the sandpaper, the quicker it gets clogged. It's a lot better for polishing and you're going to get a better result. If you're going to use a Dremel, make sure you turn down the RPM as low as it goes. Otherwise, you're going to risk melting the acrylic. And if you melt the acrylic, you pretty much need to start sanding all over again. And I strongly suggest you don't use the Dremel felt polishing attachments because it seems no matter what you do, they melt the acrylic. This cloth polishing attachment is the way to go. It's a lot better, but you need to make sure you keep it mobile. If, if it stays still for even a couple of seconds, it melts the acrylic. This polish works extremely well and you really don't need to use much. You can see here I'm spreading it down the side of the 10 millimeter acrylic and even with the small amount that I've applied, it's plenty. What you need to do, once you hit the polish with the Dremel, it spreads out very quickly and starts to disappear. Once it disappears, move on to the next area because it's only while the polish is there that you know the Dremel is really going to be doing anything. So I've been through the heavy scratch remover and the fine scratch remover. You need to go through both of those with the Dremel. And it's now time to clean up the panels. And this Novus product comes with three separate products. I think I've covered it previously in a video. It also comes with uh, Clean and Shine. So I've cleaned up both of the panels and the front panel mods are now complete and ready to be assembled. And you can see the way they've turned out. The edges have no scratches or marks whatsoever. And you can see the bevel on all of the edges. I actually haven't curved the edges, I've flattened them. And I think you can see now what I mean by even the smallest mistake on those edges and you'd be able to see it. If you curve the edges, it's not so bad if you make a mistake. But if you flatten them like this, there's basically two lines along the edges instead of one line. And if those lines don't line up, it is very easy to see. You can see all of the mounting holes in the 10 mil are perfectly vertical. And the reason for this is I'm using a drill press. So a drill press really helps out. Drilling through a th thick material with a hand drill and keeping the mounting holes vertical is very difficult. And if they're not vertical, it's a big problem because it means your measurements are out. 
because if you think about it, there's a radiator and fans going on the back side of this panel, and the holes may be in the right spot on the front of the panel, but if the holes aren't vertical, it means they're not in the right spot on the back of the panel. I'm now going back to work on the top panel mods, and I'm building a new top panel. As I've mentioned, the reason I'm doing this is so that I can move the radiator mounting holes on the top panel further towards the back of the case. And this is so that I can fit two 240mm radiators into the Bitphoenix Prodigy. There is other ways of doing this, but this is really the cleanest and most logical way of going about this. And I'm now cleaning up the panel. There's still a lot more work to do on this panel, but I like to remove all of the sharp edges before I do test fits. Because remember, as I'm building all of these panels, I'm constantly test fitting to confirm measurements and to see how it all looks. I'm now drilling the mounting holes to mount the panel to the case. And I was going to rivet this panel to the top of the case, but to match up with the rest of the mods in the build, I'm going to use button head allen key bolts to mount this panel to the case. And I actually prefer the aesthetics of button head allen key bolts compared to rivets. And, you know, it's also going to allow for this case to be easily disassembled. You know, you'll be able to completely remove this top panel with the radiator and fans on it. Then you can, you know, remove the radiator and fans after that. So it just makes it all a whole lot easier to deal with. I'm now drilling the mounting holes for the 240 millimeter radiator on the top panel. So you can see I've marked it all out and I actually used a template to do this. One thing you need when you're doing a lot of modding is a lot of templates. Every time you go to the trouble of measuring something out, you should make a template so that when, it, when you come back to it, you can quickly and easily do it again. But actually the template got me into a little bit of trouble this time because I didn't like the way the shape of this template matched up with the Black Ice GTS 240 that I'm using. So I ended up building the panel again from scratch and I traced out the exact shape of the GTS 240 so that they match up perfectly because I'm actually going to have the radiator mounted directly to this panel and the fans underneath. So I've now completed almost all of the mods to the case itself, but there is one more little mod that I still need to do. So I've cut out the top panel and front panel. I've also drilled the mounting holes in the top panel and front panel. And I've also sanded back and repainted the case, which was a massive job. I've mentioned that I'm installing a hard drive silencer into this build, and it's designed to fit into a 5.25 inch base. So it's big and it's also very heavy. There's going to be very little room left inside this build once I've installed all of the components. If you consider all of the water cooling components, the two 240 millimeter radiators, what room am I going to have left for this massive hard drive silencer? So after a, a lot of measuring and changing around the design, I came up with a position for it. And I've already started working on a mounting system. I've built this from two millimeter aluminum angle and I knew that I wanted the hard drive silencer to be visible. I wanted it to be a feature. So I'm going to mount it into this position vertically in next to the front 240 millimeter radiator. I'm actually going to turn it around the other way so that the cables are hidden. And I've decided to mount the SSDs to the bottom of it. They match up nicely because the bottom of the hard drive silencer is brushed aluminum and so is the SSDs. So this is how they're going to sit. And you know, this is going to be right up against the side panel. So I'm going to make a side panel window specifically for the SSD. So they're going to be visible from the outside of the build with the backdrop of the brushed aluminum hard drive silencer. I'm still going to use the UN mounts in combination with the mounting system that I'm building. So basically what I still have left to do to the case, I just need to drill some mounting holes on the bottom panel of the case for my mounting system. Then the aluminum fins on the other side of the hard drive silencer are going to be visible in behind the pump and res config through the other side panel window. But anyway, I'm now going to go back to the components because I've actually decided to change one of the main components. Here I have the EVGA Z77 Stinger. There's a number of reasons I'm upgrading the motherboard in this build. I'll talk about some of the other reasons coming up in the build log, 
but one of the main reasons is because of the locked vCore of the Gigabyte Z77N Wi-Fi. Some people commented about that on the last video. Now I'd love to do a separate review on this motherboard, but I currently don't have the time. So I'm now going to do a quick overview. As always with EVGA components, this motherboard comes with a number of awesome accessories, including some interesting cables. I have here two round SATA cables and they're amazing looking cables. They're all black, even the clips, which are usually silver. Two of the normal flat SATA cables and two cables you wouldn't expect to see included with a motherboard. A Molex to dual SATA splitter and a Molex to triple SATA splitter. Back IO shield, an EVGA case badge, detailed documentation and a driver and software disc. So now for a look at the motherboard itself. This motherboard comes packed with features you'd only expect to see on a full-sized high-end overclocking motherboard and still somehow it doesn't look crowded. The layout is one of my favorite things about this motherboard. It has the layout of a full-size board and the aesthetics are just awesome. It's mostly black except for a, a couple of red accents. It's really going to suit any build. So starting in the top left hand corner we have an 8 pin EPS, two 4 pin PWM fan headers, a power and reset button on board the motherboard, LED poster, two DIMM slots for up to 16 gigabytes of 2133 MHz DDR3, four SATA connectors all from the Z77 chipset, two SATA 2 and two SATA 3, the 24 pin, underneath the 24 pin is the front panel connectors, which is in a perfect position. That is where it should always be. A full time 16 PCI Express 3 slot, one USB 3 midboard header, and two USB 2 midboard headers. A great looking heatsink over the Z77 chipset. Next to that is a brushed aluminium cover, and underneath that is a mini PCI Express slot. It's for half size modules, but it's nicely hidden away there and a great feature to have on an ITX motherboard vertical CMOS battery and you can see how clear it is around the CPU socket so this is going to allow for maximum cooler and water block compatibility you could even do LN2 on this motherboard another awesome looking heatsink for the MOSFETs 7 plus 1 phase power and there's a third 4 pin PWM fan header in behind this heatsink on the back IO we have two USB 2 for a total of six USB 2 a clear CMOS button, display port, HDMI, four USB 3 for a total of six USB 3 on this motherboard. Two of them often as media controller, two eSATA ports of a Marvel controller, and eight channel audio. Looking at the back of the motherboard, you can see that there's a lot going on back here, and this is how they've managed to keep the front side of the motherboard so clean. So an amazing little motherboard. I'm really looking forward to getting into the BIOS and doing some overclocking. That's really what this motherboard is designed for. And the client has requested an overclock. So I may include some of the process of overclocking coming up in the build log. So as you can see, I've now installed the CPU memory and CPU water block. I've now completed some of the cables. So I've finished the 24 pin, both of the six pin PCIe and the eight pin EPS. I'm sleeving them in MDPC white and I'm doing heat shrinkless sleeving. I much prefer heat shrinkless sleeving. I prefer the aesthetics and it's also far more durable. These are probably the only cables that I'm going to do in white. The rest I'm going to do in black. Although I might do the SATA data cables in white also. Now, if you're going to sleeve in white, you need to do something about bleed through. You can get away with doing nothing with black cables because black bleed through with white sleeving looks okay. But if you have multicolored wires, it looks terrible. So the best thing to do is to use white wire, but then you have to build the cables from scratch. So that's what I've done here. I've built the cables from scratch with white wire. That's certainly going to give you the best result. But there are other techniques you can use. You can use white electrical tape. The problem with that is it stiffens up the wire, makes it harder to train. It also thickens it up. Some people prefer the aesthetics of thicker wire though, but the electrical tape can break down over time and the adhesive can come out through the sleeving, which looks terrible. You can also use white heat shrink over the wire, but that uses up a lot of heat shrink and it really stiffens up the wire, makes it impossible to train and it gets a lot thicker. 
I use 16 gauge wire for all of my graphics card and motherboard wiring. You can get away with 18 gauge, but you'll find that a lot of high end power supplies use 16 gauge in particular for the graphics cards. It's just not worth the risk, mainly with high performance systems that are going to be overclocked, 16 gauge is going to give you that extra headroom. Making a mistake when building cables can mean dead components. This is a very quick and easy test you can run to make sure that you've made no major errors. So I'm just using a power supply tester. I have everything hooked up and switched on. The power supply tester actually switches on and runs your power supply. It gives you some results, some voltages, but the best thing about it is it can handle shorts. It can handle cables in the wrong places. And if it's a problem, it tells you it has an alarm, it flashes red lights and then you can go back and find and fix the problem. When building cables, you need to be extremely careful and double check everything. So this is really for peace of mind more than anything, but it is an effective test. Anyway, that sums up this part of the build log. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe, like, and favorite if you want to see more.